Content warning. This series will discuss topics that may bring up painful experiences for you. Please take the time to surround yourself with good medicines. If need be, pause the playback and go for a walk, stretch, have a glass of water, and come back to the show when you feel comfortable. Welcome to the Métis Speaker Series. I'm your host, Darian Kovacs. On this podcast series, we will be exploring learning, healing, and rebuilding within the Métis community. Our goal is to create awareness of and generate discussion about Métis issues, as well as how to heal from and move forward in a healthy way. We hope to reduce Métis invisibility in BC through the personal stories from our Métis community members. This show is brought to you by Métis Nation BC and Jelly Marketing. Great to uh, meet you and have you on the show. Why don't you start off by telling us a bit about yourself? Well, Kamsi Darian, thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, it's uh, a little bit, uh, it, well, it's really exciting for me considering all of the illustrious people you've already had and already talked to. So um, I, my name is Kaya Heitland. I live on Vancouver Island and I belong to the Couch and Valley Métis Nation. Um, and I am the owner of Indigenous Nouveau. And that's my kind of my base company that I do all of my projects and all of my adventures are out of these days. That's really cool. And and so tell us about some of those projects that we would find under Indigenous Nouveau. Well, uh, the the primary focus of my business, Indigenous Nouveau, is actually a fabric that I produce. I work with a company in Montreal and we um, I produce uh, beadwork print fabrics based on some traditional Métis designs, but mostly like my own contemporary uh, explorations of my own lineage, my diverse lineage, um, using the language of beadwork. And uh, all of the fabric that I produce is organic hemp and organic cotton. It's manufactured in North America and it's all printed in Montreal. And I kind of started that aspect of my business because there was such a need for um, domestically made materials for indigenous made products. And that was a really driving force which behind pretty much everything I do in, in Indigenous Nouveau is, is really about making indigenous products from indigenous materials. And, you know, the, the idea that an indigenous product really is only indigenous if it's made here, if it's from Turtle Island, if all the components are, are from here. And, you know, there's, there's some give and take with, you know, thread and ribbons and things like that. But the more we can do to actually keep uh, supporting our own infrastructure as far as um, like production and manufacture of these products, even if they cost a little bit more, I think it's really important to put our energy into that. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and under this umbrella as well, I understand you do some teaching too. I do. Yeah. Uh, the So one half of uh, Indigenous Nouveau with a fabric and my own beadwork and my own quilt work that I sell and I, and I do um, seasonal sales. Of, of that traditional work. Um, I teach quill work and I teach beadwork work classes. Uh, I write PDFs and I do online classes for both beadwork and quill work. And I've been teaching quill work classes actually within my own community, the Couch and Valley Métis Nation um, since the fall. And we've been working on a couple of projects. We're starting up again in, in March here. And I'm pretty excited about that because we're working on a different project. And uh, it's really been a huge, it's 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 really been an amazing thing for me and myself, my own reclamation, my own investigation into my roots, because teaching other people really started to make me question, you know, my motivation behind what I do and my own teachings, um, whether they were familial teachings or community teachings or whether they're from online or whether they were from books. And so it's really helped me to categorize um, my own knowledge when I had to present it to other people, because, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of accountability that you really have to present when you're teaching classes. Um, there's protocol involved, there's elders to be consulted, there's, um, there's fact checking, you know, there's, there's all these different things that, that, that we really have to concentrate on when we're talking about teaching, skill sharing, um, land-based practices, and, and, and knowledge dissemination. Um, protocol is really essential in that to, um, to have that ritual, to have that, that, that protective aspect of traditionalism, you know, that, that, 
that preserves and curates as well as shares. It's amazing. Now, those that aren't familiar with the term or, or what, I mean, mm -hmm. not the term, but what the art and act is, what is quill work? How does that work? Oh, um, I do traditional porcupine quill work and it is, uh, an art form that's actually shared from, you know, all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast, wherever you find porcupines um, in in traditional indigenous arts uh, pre-contact. Um, and we take porcupine quills and we soften them. And I actually put them in my mouth and I soften them with my saliva and then I flatten them with my teeth and then I stitch them down in an applique technique. So it's a little bit different than when you see them applied on boxes like the Mi'kmaq and um and and other styles of of quill work but um the applique itself is not even it's not even that difficult you really just have to have a little bit of background in sewing it takes a little bit of finagling like getting the the hand-eye coordination down but uh it's very relaxing it's very um meditative and i really believe that you know beadwork and quill work are, are really forms of medicine and reconnection and that's, that's kind of the whole point of these classes right is, is to bring people in give them a group that they can belong to and um and a method of study that focuses their their search for self-reclamation and investigation into their own roots so if i've got two daughters who are say six and mm -hmm. eight years old that uh and and a 15 year old son that wants to learn quill work where would they find such quills and how do they sign up to take this teaching well, um, through uh, a couple of different uh, avenues that I'm working on right now. So through Couch and Valley Métis Nation in particular, um, it is being funded by um, by allocated for like arts arts grant program funds. And then I just actually did another application for uh, another pool work class through MMBC as a as a mentor uh, program. So I'm going to be teaching another ten students. Uh, free through, well, the, the funds are being provided through MMBC. And um, so those classes are going to be provided um, um, to the community free of cost. But right now I'm developing um, a couple of different PDFs where I'm actually going to be providing the kits, which I do for all of my classes. Everybody gets all the porcupine quills and all of the patterns and everything all ready to go. And they just, uh, we just start on video and we open the kits and we get to talk about all the, all the materials and everything uh, right from the ground up. So with a quill work class, especially, I like to talk about, um, you know, the preparation and the dyeing of the quills because I also hand dye them all myself and sort them. I have a couple of friends who um, either, the most common way to pick up a porcu pick up porcupine quills now is actually to find them as roadkill. Um, Yes, uh, it's not the most traditional way, but um, it's the best way to make use of, you know, animals that would have otherwise gone to waste that are casualties of the road. Um, porcupines are particularly um, drawn to uh, mineral salts. And so, especially on the highways where they salt the roads, porcupines like to go and lick this, like in the spring when the melt comes, they like to come and lick all the salt off the side of the road. So they, they often get hit on the road and they're not very fast so it's hard for them to avoid vehicles um wow. but that's one of my sources of quills wow. actually so, so outside of a, a zoo i've actually never seen a porcupine in, oh. in in you know outside in the world so what which maybe provinces or which areas in the provinces do you find the most porcupines or where where would one find one uh, well, we don't have that many on this side of the Rocky Mountains. They are around, uh, but if you go like pretty much east of the Rockies, you're going to find much larger po populations. And in fact, part of the classes that I teach, uh, I, I tell stories. I have a puppet. I have a porcupine puppet. His name is Kakwa, which is the Cree word for porcupine. And uh, I tell stories like uh, legends while the while the participants are doing the quill cool work. And I, and I tell stories about um, why we find porcupine in the areas that we do, why porcupine has his quills and his relationship with beaver. Him and beaver have like this eons old rivalry. So there's actually a lot of stories from the Pacific Northwest. The Haida have a few stories that talk about porcupine and beaver being in this rivalry, which is why be porcupine ends up like up in the mountains and beaver gets to stay in the in the lowlands. So um, we talk a little bit about that and uh, 
you know, have some real folklore to explain, you know, the geography of the animals themselves. And, uh, you know, some of the stories can only be told with the snow on the ground. So when I'm teaching in the winter, I have different stories than I teach in the summer because, um, you know, there's just protocol around telling stories as well and who I got them from as well, who told me the stories originally. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot to actually talk about with porcupines and porcupine ecology and just understanding, you know, their place in in um, in the world and especially like in in um, like the flatlands and into the forest region. And um, but yeah, uh, roadkill porcupines are, are a primary source for sure. But traditionally, we actually harvest porcupine quills with a blanket. Uh, with a wool blanket so you go out into the woods and you find yourself a porcupine it's much easier with two people to do it I've done it before and uh, you find yourself a porcupine you could do it with a sweater too but you flip the blanket over top of them and you just give them a quick toss and each person holds one end of the blanket and you just give them a little bit of a toss and they get a little they put this like purring vibrating sound out almost like they're hissing and vibrating so they like shake and then they drop all their quills into the blanket and then you just release him and he just kind of makes his angry little noises and goes off into the bush and then you just sit there and pick the quills out of the blanket beads though yeah not as strenuous to find them these days i imagine no no and uh Actually, one of the one of the things that I talk about in the beadwork classes that I do is the transition from the traditional uh, land based arts that were already here that allowed us to be very uh, to, to, that allowed us to already have the skills to adapt beadwork very quickly to the designs that already exist here uh, existed here on Turtle Island post contact. Um, we see in very early beadwork patterns we see very close replications of what we had already been seeing in quill work designs um, that existed pre-contact and um, the transition to a much more readily available and mass producible product like a bead um, really changed the whole face of of what indigenous art looked like especially in the north uh, and for you know the Korean and Anishinaabe and, and Métis people and you know the development of of what we consider to be Métis art today, you know, we're, we're considered the, the flower bee people. And, and that whole style, that whole, those design motifs and everything came from very uh, old rudimentary basic designs, but uh, the, the introduction of beads really allowed us to, to explore that. And then, you know, learning embroidery techniques from, you know, residential schools and, and the tutelage of nuns and, uh, try to teach marketable skills to to Métis and Indigenous women. So that's kind of that, that burgeoning trade in trying to teach them a marketable skill really began to 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 allow us to to develop this flower beadwork style. And so if I'm in, uh, say, Calgary or Vancouver or Victoria and I, and I walk into a mm -hmm. Michaels and, yes. and see uh, the bead section, could those work as traditional Métis bead artwork? Absolutely. I mean, you could use whatever beads you want, whatever, whatever works for you. I mean, there's, there's a huge size uh, difference between, you know, like say a 15, 15 .0, um bead, which is extremely tiny. They're actually too small for me to work with at this point. Um, and you can go all the way up to almost like a pony size bead. So they're, you know, like a five millimeter to a, to an eight millimeter bead. Uh, with, but with the glass beads, I usually use something around in the 10, 11 size. So you're going to find those beads like pretty, uh, pretty readily available at a Michael's or, um, or any of like the, the big bead stores, craft stores, like they're going to be, you know, certain brands are going to be a little bit more consistent. So you're going to have a little bit um, less loss. So, you know, if you pay a few more bucks more for a hank of really nice beads, you're going to be able to use more of them than say, you know, a craft store, dollar store version, which they're all going to be a little bit of, you know, different sizes and, and shapes. Are there any um, maybe Métis bead creators that we should be uh, promoting or acknowledging or? Um... Oh, bead manufacturers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I, I don't know of any Okay. bead manufacturers really in North America anymore. Most right. of them that I, most of the beads that I buy are actually from the Czech Republic mm. who have a very long and storied history of making beads. They've been making beads for thousands of years. And, um, and so the Czech Republic, it really has the monopoly on making seed beads. Yeah. Okay. That's great to know. 
Um, so if you were to go to say like a, like a store and see different maybe types of beadwork, could you mm -hmm. distinguish between who made that possibly or their traditional or their style of, of what that beadwork looks like, whether it's beadwork on clothing or um, bead jewel, you know, kind of jewelry like earrings, or is it pretty kind of as the bead world of art kind of mishmashed enough that it's, uh, it's hard to tell? Well, I think that that's, that's a very simple question. And it's also a very complex question because when I see something that's very culturally identifiable, yes, you could, you can tell that somebody has had training, they've had um, a grounding, they've either had like, you know, a familial line of beadwork or they've had a community um, around them that's really helped them to establish that style within their cultural inheritance. But the thing about the internet and the thing about Instagram and Facebook and, and us sharing stuff so widely is that um, attributions get lost really easily. So people can collect photos and images and make Pinterest boards and all this stuff. And unfortunately, it really leads to, a uh, you know, and what we see in all indigenous arts now is this pan-indigeneity that kind of like runs rampant within the indigenous um and it's not always nefarious it's not it's not always you know people taking advantage or anything it's people actually like going out and trying to connect with their roots and think you know knowing that they have beadwork in their background they have beadwork in their communities they have beadwork in their lineage but they don't really know how to approach it so they're learning stuff online and sometimes that mis that information is is a little bit like i said um photos aren't always attributed to um, what they're actually from. Like we all know that from going to a museum, you see beautiful, absolutely incredible embroidered Métis gauntlets and you know exactly where they're from. You can tell the region that they're from. You can tell which fort they were from. You know, probably you could even, you know, somebody as expert as like Gregory Schofield can look at any kind of like Métis beadwork and embroidery and tell you like within 10 years when it was made from the early 1800s and, um, the colors that were used, he knows all about the beads. He probably could tell you which families they came from based on the designs. But in museums, we'll see them attributed to, you know, Fox or Cree or, you know, there's there's all these different um, names actually placed on my TV work in particular, right? Um, and that's a whole other topic um, with, um, which, which I can talk about a little bit more, but yeah, as far as beadwork goes, yeah, the beadwork world, it's, I think it's important for us to kind of rein it in a little bit and people who are teaching, making it really clear that like when you are teaching something that's not culturally specific, the people who are learning those things need to be really clear about what they're making is not culturally specific. Um, you could be a Métis artisan and be doing beadwork and it's not necessarily Métis beadwork. And I, I know that that's something that I actually talk about a lot with my work because I do have that question brought to me a lot because what I do is not necessarily very traditional all the time. And one of those reasons is because I was not taught traditional, traditional beadwork from my family. We did, my mother did loom work um, and the other members of my family stitched moccasins and did like a very woodland style, like a much more Ojibwe, like a, a Anishinaabe style of beadwork, but it's not very specifically Métis because we're from Northern Ontario, from Thunder Bay. And um, there's a lot of that real woodlands influence that's not necessarily specifically Métis. And I wanted to express the fact that I wasn't just exclusively Métis. I want to express the fact that I am all these other things. I'm Sami and German and Scandinavian. It's really important for me to talk about like uh, using traditional two needle beadwork as a language to express all of this other vocabulary that I have. In, in my lexicon like I've got this whole box of tools but this is this is how I express you know my, my roots is, is through beadwork and so it's not always going to be traditional Métis beadwork but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not because I am Métis so you know it's it, it becomes a little bit um ambiguous you know and in in the in the in the wider beadwork community but I think as long as people are really clear about you know what they're doing and uh and how they're representing themselves. I think that that's pretty much all we can do at this point, right? So have you had the chance to watch Rutherford Falls with, with no, I have Andy not from the office. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of this and I've not seen it. The uh, the writers are all indigenous, and they mm -hmm. actually have uh, one of the characters um, runs a casino, and his daughter uh, got really 
but makes beadwork, but like really kind of uh, call it modern types of beadwork. So makes these like beautiful necklaces, but with like Pokemon characters or Amazing. really, yeah, like like and and then gives them away to her friends, and and the father's trying to get her to create a business out of it, but he's just really proud to see that his daughter has adopted bead, but is doing it in kind of a new modern way. Um, and it's just that wrestle between the father who likes the traditional, you know, beadwork, but you mm -hmm. just embrace this new style and, and kind of mix the two worlds. I really love that. I really love seeing that. I, I there's there's so many amazing bead workers out there that I just that are doing, you know, so much pop culture stuff and um and I I think that it can only enrich the beadwork community. But like I said, like we just when it's very obviously a pop culture reference, it, it it's something separate, right? Of course. Um, but I think that it is just really important, like especially with the Métis beadwork, which is something, like I said, I don't do a lot of because that's not actually where my training is. Um, but I do use those traditional like woodland beadwork techniques. Um, but, you know, there's there are plenty of beadworkers out there who are doing you know, uh, brick stitch and peyote stitch and these like Pueblo Indian styles of beadwork that are very, that are very identifiable as, as a technique that is not necessarily from Canada. And um, they are technically still Métis beadworkers. Of course they are. They are, they're Métis and they're doing beadwork. But there is a differentiation between that and traditional uh, Métis and woodlands work. Um, so I think it's just important to have that conversation, like without, without bias and without derision, but I think that that's, those conversations can only strengthen, you know, the beadwork community by being honest and, and, and by, yeah, having transparent conversations about, about, you know, what, what is considered traditional and what is not, because that's how you, that's how you refine and, you know, cultivate tradition. And, and I think it's even how we identify ourselves, you know, when you win Absolutely. people who have, you know, amazing, <laughs> beautiful introductions that I'm always quite jealous of because they, they, they've they articulated them so clearly of explaining, you know, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. This is where my parents, you know, this is my parents' lineage. Like, it's quite beautiful mm -hmm. that people have done that. So it's almost the, you know, the art you create. This is where it came from. This is its history. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. We've heard the term traditional land-based arts and traditional land-based arts practices. Um, what does that term mean to you in, in the work that you do and in, in the style of art that you teach? Well, I um, well, I have to say right off the bat, traditional land-based practices and land-based arts are pretty much the, the fundamental core of what I do at Indigenous Nouveau because I don't believe that you can share anything without a teaching. It's part of your responsibility as, as a practitioner of traditional arts to share your own experience and to share knowledge about preservation of those skills. Um, but I can only speak to my own teachings, my own familial practices and the things that I've adopted through, through, through knowledge seeking and, and, and learning and classes that I myself have taken. So um, for me, when we talk about land-based practices, which can be anything from hunting to fishing, to, to arts, to every, to, you know, pretty much any traditional practice that reinforces relationships between us, the people and the land. And when it comes to something like porcupine quill work or bead work and using, you know, traditionally smoked and tanned hides, like the connection is really quite obvious. You can see, you know, you can, you can make the decision between using factory tanned leather or traditionally produced moose hide that your friend tanned and smoked from her father who shot the moose. You know, there's 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 a real clean line there between what is an indigenous product and what's not an indigenous product. Um, even though you know the the commercially tanned hide might be from indigenous hunters, and and the and the best way to to mass produce it is to to take it to a tannery, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's about trying to at every step of the process reinforce its connection with the land so at any given point making sure that you are you are actually paying attention and making the effort to choose the mo most ethical option the most indigenous produced option and and the most ecologically sound option so when it comes to land-based practices i even like i said have 
adopted that with the production of my fabric because I want to make sure that people who are making ribbon skirts can make something that's slightly closer to a more genuinely indigenous product because it was actually made here from plants that were grown in North America and printed here with like ecological inks and, and we're not outsourcing to another country. And it's, it, it is about, you know, really taking into consideration the ecological footprint, whether that's shipping things from overseas or whether that's involving, you know, people who, who have or do not have respect for indigenous practices in their own businesses and their own business ethics. So land-based practices, when it comes to business, like it, it, it's not, it's not really that hard to, to try to, to incorporate that relationship between us and the land. Um, for when we're really talking about land-based practices themselves, um, I mean, again, I, the first things that come to mind for me are, are going out and, and producing very authentic, unquestionably authentic materials. So, um, things like moose hide and deer hides and porcupine quills and things like that are, are seen just as products themselves you know it's not just something that you can buy and you can sell it's it's something that that has inherent value that has a respect that's owed to it and at every stage of preparing like a piece of quill work like paying homage to that like you have something in your hand that came from an animal and like constantly reinforcing that for yourself that relationship between you the user of that product and our relationship with the land. I think, I think that that's, that's essential at, at every stage. So when you think of Métis specific land-based practices, uh, what's special about that? And, and what does that mean to you? Well, I think that um, it's absolutely essential to Métis identity. And in, in, in the age that we're in now with this beautiful reclamation, this invigorating, uh, bright and vibrant uh, resurgence of Métis culture, especially um, in, in, in young people and craftspeople and in being interested in land-based practices, being interested in, in, traditional, um, in traditional arts and hunting and fishing and, and, and land reclamation. Um, it's it's such a huge core part of our search for our our, ident of our identity, and this is something that I almost kind of touched on before. But you know, with the attribution of of a lot of our own arts, our beadwork and our and our quill work and things in museums that 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 haven't been actually given the credit as being as being Métis pieces, you know, that in and of itself is a real indicator of of the struggle that Métis people have gone through to reclaim an identity that, you know, that we, you know, when we were disenfranchised, you know, voluntarily or, or not, or, you know, against our will, um, we lost that connection. We severed a lot of connections between our traditional practices and, and the lives that we were living. And we did that for our safety. We did that to, you know, avoid road allowance uh, living. We did that to avoid racism. We did that to avoid stigma. And, you know, that's something that my own family went through pretty harshly. And um, that denial of our Indigenous identity. And so land-based practices are absolutely essential for reclaiming our identities for reclaiming relationships with the other indigenous communities that our grandfathers and grandmothers were a part of because they weren't separate. They weren't different people. They lived together, you know, and this is something that I actually really talk about a lot with, um, with my newest project, the ribbon skirt project, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, in full. But um, one of the things that I, that I'm very, very strong about telling people on a path to reclamation and whether that's through beadwork or community or whether that's through going to sweat lodge or whether that's learning your language or whether that, you know, whether that's just going to a rendezvous and, and watching and, and throwing axes and doing archery and, and just being part of it and going and going to a dance and jigging um, that 
we represent a very unique facet of Indigenous culture, where we walk a very interesting line. We have a foot in both worlds. We speak both languages. And that affords us a very privileged position as mediators between um, settlers and Indigenous people because we have experiences in, in, in these two these two different worlds. And on the road to reclamation of your identity and like really investigating your roots, one of the things that comes up a lot is um, for a lot of people, especially women, I think, um, a lot of the women that I've connected with, with, because it's mostly been women in my beadwork circles and quill work circles, um, something that we talk about a lot is imposter syndrome. And, um, I like to just remind people that being half of something doesn't make you less than. It makes you twice as much. You are bringing twice as much back to your community. You are part of two worlds. You are bringing knowledge and inheritance and culture from two different places. And why wouldn't that make you twice as much? And so you know, us having suffered such a strong cultural loss of a lot of our indigenous roots and practices through, you know, being being disabused of our of our rich indigenous culture through, you know, the systematic um, disenfranchisement of, of our people, um, we begin to question that. We begin to question our value. And I think that the real... I think that the real way forward is accepting all of your parts and accepting yourself as a whole and not looking at yourself as less than because you have a certain percentage of indigenous blood, but because you belong to this rich and amazing vibrant community of this like very identifiable and strong and, and, and unique lineage. Um, and I don't, I don't think that, I, I don't think that anybody should be made to feel less than because of a disconnect. I think that everybody should be welcomed to, you know, everybody's going to have completely different traditions too, right? Of course, like some of us are 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 very closely connected to the indigenous communities that that um that our grandmothers came from and and some of us, you know, came from lineages that never spent any time with indigenous communities. So we're all going to have different familial traditions. But I think it's really important for all of us to go on that search and figure out what's actually appropriate for each person individually, because it is so diverse. There's such a such an incredible difference tradition wise from, you know, Quebec all the way to British Columbia. Um, we're going to have influences from so many indigenous groups and and uh, and different, you know. Different accents, as it were, you know. So that's that's something I talk a lot about in in the ribbon skirt project is is it's it's about investigation and you can't you can't have that sense of wholeness without accepting all parts of yourself equally or valuing one more than the other. That's just not a healthy way to go about it. It's very colonist, very colonist view, right? We talk about that a lot in the Métis community about bug quantum and how how you know um, how disfiguring that can be to yourself your sense of self and your self-worth and your identity so yeah no it's 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 amazing you've articulated it so well beautiful thank you so you mentioned ribbon skirt project yes the ribbon skirt project tell us about what this is and what it means I'm very excited to start talking about this because I finally unveiled it. Uh, I recently received an arts grant, uh, an arts culture grant through Métis Nation British Columbia to start off this project. And I originally thought it was just going to be, you know, me providing a little bit of teachings, collecting teachings and, and talking to other elders and ribbon skirt makers and talking to elders and other ribbon skirt makers to kind of compile a project to or compile a pdf to to start to teach people how to make ribbon skirts but through the funding that i was able to get through mmbc i actually built an entire website that has begun to evolve into something a lot larger than i thought it was going to be so the basis of the project is i am going to create 100 ribbon skirts for Métis individuals in British Columbia, and they're going to be fully funded by Métis Nation British Columbia. And I am providing those with 
uh, online classes as well. So we're going to do a PDF. Well, I'm, I've already written the PDF and each person gets an instructional for the ribbon skirts. Then they get invited and we're all going to do like a ribbon skirt making circle. So we're going to do them in sets of like 25 students per class. Pretty exciting. And um, and we're really for the first hundred skirts, we're really trying to get people who are really in need of this. So I have posted on my Instagram and on my Facebook and uh, I will give you all the the URLs and everything. Um at the end of this, but I am taking nominations for the ribbon skirt slots for the first 100 of them, because we really want to go in like into the smaller communities and charter communities for people who are really in need of connection, who are isolated because of COVID-19, who are isolated because of disability or geography, or people who are not financially in a position where they've been able to build, make their own regalia or buy their own regalia. And so I am, providing all of the fabric, all of my own indigenous beadwork patterns. So all of the fabric actually comes from my company, Indigenous Nouveau, and we're providing these 100 kits to members of the community. And That's so... And, and those <laughs> that, again, those that don't know what a ribbon skirt is, maybe catch us up on that. What is that? Okay. So this is a very, very large topic. I can give you a very brief uh, description of what they are, but yeah. the website itself, actually, if you want to go and visit the website, it is www.theribbonskirtproject.ca. And, we'll and put links, I have all the links in the excellent. show notes for that's, sure. Yeah. That's great. Um, and there's also a, a Facebook and an Instagram, but um, I actually on the website, have done basically a dissertation with the amount of research that I had done for this project, because it was really important for me to establish a, a historical context for the ribbon skirt existing in Métis culture. Yeah. And um, so one of the, the larger parts of this project was actually providing education to the individuals in the classes to understand where the ribbon skirt came from originally and uh, the way that the Métis had an influence on the development of what we call the modern ribbon skirt, because it, through antiquity, um, what were considered ribbon skirts are actually very different than their modern sisters. So we have a very long um, and story tradition of, of sacred skirts um, through, I mean, almost, almost all indigenous groups across Turtle Island, almost all nations have, have different traditions around the skirts. And again, I will only speak about my, my own knowledge, my own, my own uh, study and my own research. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and my own stories and my own experiences growing up and being a teenager and being introduced to ribbon skirts are also on the, on the website. But um, the adaptation of the traditional buckskin skirts and dresses and ceremonial dresses and tea dresses of the plains and the woodlands. Um, and that architecture that already existed here with, um, with the sacred and ceremonial dresses and how that merged with, um, how that merged with European materials and European sensibilities and, and, and European uh, clothing culture when it arrived. And there's quite an extensive history section actually on the website talking about um, right from the beginning of what, ev what evidence we have, pictorial and uh, anecdotal evidence for, for Métis women and indigenous women, our indigenous grandmothers wearing their traditional skirts and, and adapting those designs with, with um, you know, these modern fabrics, wools and, and silk and gingham and, and all of these different things that came from overseas. And then with the introduction of fab, with in the introduction of ribbons and lace um, as trade goods and the ribbon work that actually evolved from that and the Menomine and the Fox and, um, and the Anishinaabe were particularly um, proficient at these really beautiful folded geometric um, ribbon designs. And so when we talk about and I, again, with the history page on the website, I do talk about this too, that when we're talking about the Métis in a historical context that far back, we're not talking about the Métis as the modern Métis nation that we consider ourselves to be when we, when we found autonomy as a nation. We're talking about the lowercase Métis. We're talking about people of, um, of mixed indigenous and European descent, um, Métis in the very literal sense of being mixed people, um, country born daughters. Um, and country-born daughters and sons. And, um, 
through my own research, actually, I had a pretty fun time reading, <laughs> again, with the amount of research that I've done on this project, I was reading ledgers from the Hudson's Bay from the early 1800s from Fort Albany. And I came across the actual records of imports of ribbon to the fort at Fort Albany between 1805 and 1807, which coincidentally is actually when my great, 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 great grandfather was the um, chief factor at Fort Albany for the Hudson's Bay Company, um, who was John Hodgson. And he actually um, is the the ancestor of a large group of Métis people because he then married um, a woman of the land named Mary and had, um, well, an illustrious six sons and many daughters. And so there are a lot of different Métis lineages that come out of that marriage. And then, so while my ancestor was chief factor at the time, we have these records of actual ribbon imports and the men that were living at the fort who are buying these ribbons for their wives and their daughters. And so I went and did all this genealogical research on each individual person, each man that was living at the fort at the time. And each one of them married a woman of the land or had married a Métis woman. And so we actually have direct history of this material, these ribbons being brought in for Métis people to adorn their clothing at that time. And it was such an interesting investigation for myself into my own personal family culture this the members of my family and there were two men on the list who married children of that chief factor and his wife mary who were one of my ancestors so these were like my great 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 uncles who were buying ribbon for their metis daughters and their and their cree wives and it was hundreds and hundreds of meters of ribbon over the course of a few years. Like it was, it was 357 total meters between five guys. That's a huge amount of ribbon to be buying for, for sewing projects within the home. So this whole project for me was, was really about going back as far as we could to establish, like I said, a historical context for the production of ribbon adorned uh, clothing. Um, but in a in a traditional context, but w within the forts and everything. So I actually found this this actual historical information that that backed up my that backed up my hypothesis. It's amazing, it's amazing. So this year we can expect to see a hundred new skirts enter. Yes. The the, the, the fashion enter the community. Um, yeah. It's amazing. So that but that whole history that I that I've just been talking about now. Um, that is all part of the course that I'm putting together. Like everybody gets this informational packet and then all of the photos that I've compiled from the Glenville Museum and the University of Calgary with all of this actual historical context for Métis women wearing ribbon skirts all the way from 1800 to, um, they kind of stop the historical photos stop around uh, the, the centennial uh, in 1967. Um, are kind of the last historical photos that I've been finding. Um, and then I talk about the ribbon skirt in, in contemporary Métis culture, in modern Métis culture. Um, but yeah, this is all part of it. It's not, it's not just about making a ribbon skirt. It's not just about learning how to do a zigzag stitch and put in an elastic. It's really about having a, a, a real cultural context to understand where that exists for us. You know, this, this, this is us deciding that we aren't going to subscribe to, you know, the this pan indigeneity of just the idea that all indigenous people wear a ribbon skirt or, or that all indigenous people do a particular kind of beadwork. But I really wanted to have like a grounding in, in, like I said, a historical context for Métis women and, and individuals who do wear ribbon skirts to, to know where it comes from. And, and I love the um, conversations that'll spark. We talk about, you know, it's a conversation piece, like something we put in our house, but the clothes we wear can often be conversation starters. So for someone Absolutely. to ask about the skirt and then to be able to give that context is pretty good. Oh, totally. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons that I actually started making ribbon aprons. I've been making ribbon aprons for a couple of years now. And, um, and it was really about the fact that ribbon skirts had been kind of relegated to being such a ceremonial and sacred um, piece of clothing that it, it, 
for such a long time that it wasn't something that was really in in our everyday wear in our everyday life like now we see them as being as being pretty pretty prominent in indigenous culture and in Métis culture but um but I didn't see a lot of that and I wanted people to have the ribbon skirt in the home and bring that ceremonial into their daily life so I started making ribbon aprons with my fabric and putting ribbons on them so people could wear them while they were cooking for their families and doing you know practicing land-based practices and cooking and canning and doing preserves and wearing their ribbon skirt as an apron like in the home and bringing that into their their daily life you know that reinforcement it's incredible it's incredible so speaking to and and this is exactly who you're you know those that are maybe new to discovering their metis heritage mm -hmm. and those that have known they've been metis a long time um maybe you want to say two different things to those two different groups of people that are listening right now but what's maybe like a first step for those that have yet to um try beading try um quill work um try making a skirt like what what's a kind of a first step they can do to kind of reconnect to that history to that heritage well, again, this is a very large question. This is a very big question. But give me, give me like a baby um, step. What's like a baby for someone that's never done anything? What, where's the first place they should go? Maybe even like, what could they do as a first step to be like, I want to try this? Well, I think that, I think that number one, pursuing um, traditional arts and land-based practices is absolutely an incredible way to start to reconnect to your community. Um, there are dozens of beadwork and quill work classes going on across this province on a weekly basis. And I encourage everybody to really try to spend more time reconnecting with their individual nation that they belong to. Like that's really the core of, of the strength of the Meiji nation is our individual communities, our charter communities and our actual individual people that we see on a daily basis and meeting the elders in your circle. Like actually asking who your elders are. I know so many Metis people who don't even know who the elders are in their actual nation. Um, and so it's really important to like take the first step to actively identify yourself as a member because that's really what being a Metis in this province is a, a lot of it is about, is about self-identification. And it's about you taking that first step in identifying yourself as a person of Métis heritage, identifying yourself within your community and being active within your community. Those are the prerequisites for, for belonging to the Métis nation. And um, I and, love that description. Yeah, I love it. and, it's, it, and those, that's really what it's about. Yeah. And those that have, and just to jump here, those that have yet to meet an elder and to understand mm -hmm. the importance of elders would you almost describe it and those that maybe know this reference but like like if you look at star wars where there's like the jedi masters That's and there's true. padawans right the only way to pass on the real learning of the jedi abilities was through meeting a jedi master who could pass it on and teach and pass down the stories and the legends and, Absolutely. and help and help and and the wild thing is the padawans were already jedis they just mm -hmm. didn't know how to pull it out of themselves and they had understand. the midichlorians in their blood yes right they, yeah Totally. Okay. Yeah. Wait, wait, is, is that is that is that fairly comparable? I I think so to a certain extent, especially when we're talking about things like stories and protocol, like things that are really necessary to yes. be preserve as they are, because those are the things that that make traditions what they are. Yes. Is 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 protocol is following those rules, and and it took me a while to really understand that because I was very separated from a lot of my family culture. And so I had to do a lot of my own, my own self investigation, my own, and my own pursuit. I had to teach myself a lot of things because I didn't have a lot of people around me. And so as an adult, I made the effort to go. And after having beaded for 20 years in some, like in some styles, um, going out and actually like talking to people and realizing that things that I had been doing wrong for years were actually huge faux pas culturally, you know, like, and especially when it came to teaching, like I, when I started to teach beadwork and I didn't teach it in, as in being a position of, of a knowledge keeper or anything like that, but what I would have been doing had I not pursued that aspect of it, had I not pursued elders, had I not talked to people, had I not gotten permission culturally, from others to be able to teach had I not learned stories had I not learned protocol around teaching and, and the ceremony around it and the ritual around it it would have been hollow and I would have been feeding into this kind of idea of pan-indigeneity and just the idea of this free-for-all of like learning whatever you want and then applying whatever name you want to it um 
And so it's really important that you reach out to members of your community who are renowned for certain things, who have that cultural knowledge. Like that's that's really the basis of, of cultural preservation is making sure that you're asking the right people. Um, and I'm still learning every single day. Like I've consulted like a dozen separate elders for this ribbon skirt project and all of them have completely different ideas from saying that Métis people don't wear ribbon skirts to all the way to the other side to being like, no, the ribbon skirt is a Métis invention. So like there is such a huge gamut to run, like the, the myriad of different experiences within the Métis community is is really astounding because we do come from such disparate parts of the country with different influences culturally. And, um, and so it is really important to like talk to people and they don't nullify each other too. Like one, one person uh, telling their cultural story, their familial story doesn't negate somebody else's story. And so that's why this project became so large is because I really wanted to include as much as I could to give a spectrum for people to understand their own con their own place in in Métis culture so yeah consulting your elders being part of your community being active in your community asking how you can volunteer for things like rendezvous yeah. you know ask when their cultural events going to happen um asking and, and and you know as 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 individual nations get funding you know getting put on going to some of the meetings the executive meetings putting forward propositions for you know maybe we should look at allocating some funds to bring in a bead worker to teach us these things or bringing in a quill worker or is there somebody in the community that we can reach out to is there an elder here who has stories they can tell yeah. you know like be active in your community this is about you your identification with yourself like you have to ask these questions it's 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 a citizenry we belong to a community of citizens like you have to be an advocate for your own culture um that's the most important part i think for me is reconnecting on like a like a smaller level on a community right. level that you already belong to and, and to sum it up it don't just ask what they can do for you your community but what can no. you do for your community that's what i think no is so cool. yeah how can absolutely yeah how can you can be a part of it like and that's yeah. you know when we do talk about land-based practices it's it's about asserting your rights it's about yeah. you self-identifying but also identifying with what you want to see in your community like right. you really have to do that deep dive and and doing things like you know signing up for the harvester card and and exercising your section 35 rights yeah. you know your harvesting rights as an indigenous person like go on that website and you can do it without a hunting license like you can do it without hunting sign up for your harvest card do the harvester survey like i think it's open still until june uh, it's really important to do that because like you're identifying yourself as an active member of your community who's interested in these cultural practices who's interested in land-based practices you you you're you know you're actively participating and it's not just about like getting those numbers up it's about making sure that there's funding in the future for these things yeah. so you know advocating for yourself and what you want for your community you know, do it's simple things like that. But yeah, everybody go and sign up for your harvest card because we do want to get those numbers up so that we can, you know, expand those section 35 rights as well. I love it. I love it. I have to say, we need to bring you back for part two. I, I would love oh, that. absolutely love it. Yeah. So much more to talk about. This has been, oh, amazing. I could go on for, <laughs> Thank it's been you a great, for joining great us. time. Yeah. Thank so you. we'll have you back again. I think there's so much more to talk about, especially when it comes to, there's two questions I want to ask you about next time, how to build better relationships with first nation land stewards mm. in BC and land preservation from a Métis perspective. So we're going to talk about that next time. Excellent. You've been amazing. This has been an incredible episode. We're going to put all the notes in the show notes here. Uh, thank you again for being here this week. Awesome. Marcy, Darian, like I've had an amazing time. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you for everyone for joining us. And we'll see you next time on the show. Hi, welcome today. Uh, I'm here with Darian Kovacs and we're doing the second session of our Métis Speak series with me, Kaya Heitland. I'm the owner and operator of Indigenous Nouveau. And for those who have listened to our first episode, um, the first the first portion of our interview was 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 very um, was a little bit more educational. It was a little bit more political. It was a little bit more. Um, a little bit more informative about the projects that I've been working on, uh, but today we are here to speak a little bit about the actual artistry of the of the techniques that I do, and to talk about some of the pieces that I've brought with me, so you guys can have a real visual example of of what I was talking about in the first episode, and to give just a little bit more background and a little bit more um, 
a little bit more insight into what motivates me to run my company and, and do the projects that I do. Amazing. Amazing. And, and I know that we talked about the porcupines in, mm. in the interview and, and how you get the quills off of the porcupine. Yeah. And I think we're going to try to find some porcupine voices for that. Or, yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Honestly, voices, you know, the sounds that yeah. they make. Um, but today, I was really excited to actually feel and touch. You've come into studio, some of the artistry and, and work that you've created mm -hmm. today. So those that are listening on audio, we're going to describe uh, with audio uh, voices and describe, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what the term they use when sometimes you watch something, but as much... The described audio. Described yeah. audio. We're going to yeah. use described audio to mm -hmm. go through this experience. So uh, on the table before me, I've got some items. Why don't we start with the one that's closest to me here. Tell me what I have here in my hands. Um, there, uh, you're holding a large uh, sash pin. It's got two pins in the back. Mm -hmm. It's made out of smoked and brain tanned deer skin. It's got real smoky, beautiful, buttery texture to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the applique on top is uh, Czech and Toho beads and uh, elk hair. Uh, Roosevelt elk hair from Vancouver Island that was hunted by somebody that I know, another Métis person, coincidentally. Yeah. Um, and I've been tanning the hide itself for the last couple of months mm -hmm. and just finished my scraping. And uh, this was some of the hair that I that I salvaged from the hide before I started making it into leather. It's amazing. So I'm gonna do a little sound check. Hear that here? Call they, ASMR experience. Yeah, <laughs> they look like I want to say little fluff balls or sea urchins of oh, sorts, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but a little rougher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is amazing. And do you go? Is it more of a texture thing, or is it more of a look and feel thing, or where did you learn to do, use this application here? Um, I actually learned how to do this application almost exclusively from looking at actual pieces. I've never okay. been trained in this formally. I've never taken a class. I've never talked to anybody about it. And yeah. I just had to kind of figure it out uh, by looking at, 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 at art pieces that mm. I'd seen and, um, and some reference from books. And it's always an art form that really fascinated me, being from Northern Ontario. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of caribou hair that's used yeah. in... Um, in in some traditional traditional Cree and Ojibwe like the woodlands art you yep. do see like caribou like reindeer uh, tufting and moose hair tufting as well wow so, so if I'm gonna hold this mm -hmm. I'm gonna call it a, a brooch or a, mm -hmm. a, a pin of some sort we, so we got beadwork around the edging we got mm -hmm. beadwork inside we've got uh, the hide work that you did mm -hmm. and uh, what, what's the technical term for these the it's tufting yeah tufting is the hair, balls hair right? tufting yeah. hair tufting so almost three disciplines on one brooch yeah absolutely just, okay that yeah. is incredible and how did you get the the tufting balls to stick to the actual hide so it's all stitched in so the wow. back is applied afterwards to cover up all the stitching yeah. and all of the the threads so uh you clean yeah. and wash all of the elk hair yeah um and then you dry out the hides. So you just have these dry pieces of rawhide with all the hair coming out of them. Yeah. And then clip off little chunks of it. And then you form a loop with a piece of sinew that you stitch through. And then you pull it extremely tight. And because the hairs are hollow and very light, yeah. they all compress up into this giant puff ball. And then you trim them with scissors until they're the shape that you want. Wow. Yeah, so it's a very unique technique. And the smell is amazing. I'm mm. smelling it here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting a smoky kind of absolutely. Yeah, like yeah. like I just went camping and I'm and I'm leaving the campgrounds and I'm in my car with my friends and I smell and it smells so good. Everything I own smells like a campfire. Yeah. It's yeah. the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is incredible. And, and when you wear this, you can give it a nice smell and think of that. Absolutely. Right? Memory. You know, something that I I hear a lot from my clientele. A mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of my clients they. When they get a piece that's made from that smoked yeah. deer skin, they they say that it smells like home. Mm. You know, people who didn't even grow up around mm -hmm. hides yeah. or around hide tanning yeah. or around traditional moccasins or anything, when they smell it, they they know that that's what's ho that what home is supposed to smell like. Wow, it's such an interesting piece and of most homes genetic smell memory. Like that, though, Absolutely, right? you'd you have a fire were, inside yeah. the house. You know, you'd you'd have these smoked hides. Yeah. You'd have. You know, you, you'd smell like fire all the time. You didn't wash your clothes no. all the time, you know. And uh, so, yeah, for me, smoke tide is a real, real like, really draws you back yeah. into the history of the, like, the cultural inheritance of these pieces. And I think in the, the Métis community, I think I'm learning more and more the whole mm -hmm. idea of deep calls to deep in other interviews where whether it's music, right, the fiddle mm -hmm. music, and there's something that resonates within people that whether it's physically or emotionally or psycho, whatever it is. Absolutely. It's in yeah. the bones. Those and real the... examples of like genetic memory. Yeah, yeah, 
Mm. So uh, I will start with uh, this bag on the side here. This is actually one of my personal pieces from my own regalia. Um, and the entire bag is about, I'd say 14 inches long with a long fringe on it. For those who are um, listening in on audio, we're going to do our best to do a real described audio experience for you. Um, all of these pieces will also have photos available on my website if you're curious afterwards to take a look at them if you don't have a chance to watch the audio portion of this. So this bag is entirely made from smoked and brain tanned deer skin and this is a very special hide actually. And what kind of tanned did you say? Oh, brain tanned. What does that mean? Um, so these, these hides are tanned very traditionally um, in the brain tanning method, which is something that is um, descended from both indigenous practices and Stone Age practices. So okay. brain tanning exists uh, in Europe, mm. um, and people who you know who work on you know Stone Age technology mm. and mm -hmm. stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, doing doing flint napping and stuff like that. Brain tanning is 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 experiencing quite a resurgence in, in Europe, as well as in North America, um, from the indigenous mm. uh, um, crafts people mm. that have, that have practiced it for generations. But um, the hides themselves are scraped and turned into rawhide or then uh, treated with brains. Traditionally, you'd use the brain of the actual animal. Yeah. But nowadays, um, it's pretty easy to get brains from your butcher. Okay. Um, and then using that as a treatment to, um, to, to chemically alter and then soften the hide. Okay. So brains are just good for that. Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of acids in the brain that okay. actually release natural tannins in the process. Wow. Um, so you can like feel the, t the, yeah. towel, the wow, it's tassels. So soft. It's so soft. It's the most soft, buttery, gorgeous. Wow. Like it's almost oily without leaving any yeah. uh, anything on your hands. It's just got the most wow. beautiful texture. And these mm -hmm. you mentioned are, are different colored porcupine quills. This yeah. is this is the pro this is the end result of what you talked about, where you 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 get the porcupine quills, whatever method you mm -hmm. use, and then you chew on them. Right? Yeah, you correct? flatten them in your teeth. You, you, them you your soften teeth. them in your cheek, and then they get saturated with saliva. And then I use my I use my teeth to flatten the quills individually, and then apply uh, and then do applique with them, and actually stitch them down on on the leather itself. So it is a pretty painstaking process. Yeah. It's it's almost a little bit more labor intensive. Well, it is more labor intensive than beadwork because you do have to do all the prep with the quills yeah. yourself. And dye them, at what stage is that happening? Um, after I get my quills, yeah. I have to degrease them. So yeah. there's a process of um, using a detergent and then getting all the oils and grease and everything off of them. So you have to imagine your whole kitchen sink full of soapy water and thousands and thousands of quills that yeah. you then have to plunge your hands into yeah. to like, to strain out and then individually sort them all and then dye them and then sort them again into different usages yes. because all quills are different sizes. So they're used for different methods and different techniques. And wow. and so, yeah, I've used um, all medium-sized quills for this pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then this is almost all a zigzag technique that I've used for this bag in particular right. just because I really wanted it to be a demonstration of just pretty much that one technique because that's yeah. in my classes. It's, it's one of the things that I... It's one of the stitches that I use most predominantly because it's, it's it's pretty pretty simple one to learn. When you mention regalia, mm. those that are, are curious to know, what does a Métis regalia look like, and and when do you wear this? Well, I you know, for me, it's almost a misuse of the word. Okay. Um, you know, regalia f for most people will conjure up an image of of um, a powwow regalia mm. or. Um, First Nations regalia in particular, um, when I think about regalia, I, I think about what the meaning of the actual word is and and to regale oneself mm. um, with your traditional um, pieces and, and your colors and your traditional clothing is to identify yourself yeah. as having belonged to a certain group. Yeah. It's not necessarily about, you know, First Nations designation or anything, but it's about like the the have your own heraldry, your family heraldry, yeah. your family colors, yeah. and your uh, your pieces of cultural significance that you know that identify you as being you. Um, so uh, this is one of the pieces that I wear. This is actually a, a sash bag that I wear on my waist. It's mm -hmm. taken from a design put together by Gregory Schofield in one of his books that was put out by the Gabriel Dumont Institute, and that book is available. Um, and it's on small Métis bags. Hmm. Very, uh, very informative. Um, you know, he's one of the... I talked about him in my last... Mm -hmm. um, in our last segment, but definitely an authority on... on um, 
the history and, and evolution of these pieces. Yeah. So it was really important for me to make something that was, you know, um, pretty traditional based yeah. on the designs that he'd um, he'd um, pulled like extrapolated from museum pieces. It's amazing. So, yeah. And I noticed you're also today wearing your sash. I am wearing my sash. And in what on what occasion do you wear your sash? Most days, or is it part of the again using the term regalia? Mm connecting yourself to your heritage? Once again, I, I, I wear my sash on occasions um, that uh, warrant me identifying myself. Yeah, and I felt like today was a yeah. really good way, no, way to do it's that. Great. Yeah. It's um, great. Yeah, but I do, I, I, I don't wear it like a scarf. I don't wear it haphazardly. I don't, yeah. it's, it's not a casual thing. I do wear it um, on very specific occasions. Yeah. It, it, to, to have it be, uh, a bit more of a special piece, yeah, you know? And great. I wear it around my waist because it's actually much more of a practical um, a practical thing for me. Yeah. I've never worn mine over my over my shoulder. Yeah. Like, that's generally appropriate, considered appropriate for women because mm -hmm. if I'm gonna wear a sash, it's because I'm gonna be tucking a bunch of stuff into it. I'm gonna wear yeah. my knife off of yeah. it. I'm gonna wear my, you know, my pipe bag and stuff like that. So uh, awesome. I've always worn it around my waist as part of my regalia. Very cool. Mm. So moving on, we got a pair, I'm going to assume earrings here. Yes, yes, these are a pair of earrings. Which again, I can see both beadwork and porcupine quill yes. work. Now the coloring here is both white and I want to say a brownish tone. Mm. Is that the original, are these the yeah, original colors of the, the quill? Yeah, this is the natural colors of the actual quills and I kept them completely natural. Wow. Piece. So that would be the zigzag at one part and then with these, it looks like the tip of the quills, mm -hmm. the skinny yeah. part. Okay. Yeah, so I just clipped these ones and then used them as beads, actually. So I selected very wow. stiff, strong quills for that, yep. and then the, that contained the patterning that I wanted for the effect that I wanted, and mm -hmm. then clipped them off and uh, used them as beads. That is incredible. And is it all stringed together here, like all kind of sewn together? Is, or Every, is it any glue No, work? everything is sewn, absolutely wow. everything, except for some of the findings, like some of the yeah. pin backs and, and the yeah, earring yeah. backs. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll secure them with a little extra glue, but yeah. every all of the... Um, the technique itself is all hand uh, hand stitched. Wow! And moving on here, we yeah. have a, a, a knife actually, right? Or yeah, this is my knife sheath. This is my um, well. This is again is part of my regalia. This is yeah. a piece that I wear that yeah. I made for myself, um, and uh, it is quilled and beaded. Mm -hmm. And for those who are familiar with my work, you'll see motifs of. Food plants okay. feature very predominantly yeah. in the work that I do because I, um, well, I'm obsessed with food. Is this uh, a blueberry then? Yeah, they're Okay, that's yeah. what I thought I was going to say. Okay, great. I'm, uh, that is amazing. Yeah. I think they're the best type of plants there are. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're useful both for beauty and for eating Yeah, afterwards. absolutely. And I will talk about the, the blueberry in a little bit as well after we finish yeah. with the smaller pieces. But yeah, the, the knife itself is actually a, a caribou antler handled knife as well that was made for me. And wow. that's... That's what I use for a lot of my skinning and tanning. And wow. it needs a good polish because I've, again, been out in the bush yep. uh, scraping a hide with it lately, so. And this, can you tell me about mm -hmm. this? Because actually I just read a book with my daughter last mm -hmm. night about making this long, this looks like a lot of work. It is a lot of thick, work. it's and it's long mm -hmm. and it's different colors. So this is a beaded lanyard. It's it's just using a twining technique. Okay. So um, you put the beads on one side and then you twine it around and then you use the other Thread. So it's a two-needle technique, and um, it's actually beaded onto paracord. Wow. So onto a nylon woven core cord, and then you stitch through it. So every every row actually gets two stitches. Wow. So every single row that's on there gets stitched on twice Okay. Um, to keep it nice and even. But it's a very simple entry-level technique that you can use, so it's a really good... Um, uh, way to learn bead control and tension and things like okay. that, especially for kids. It's yeah. something very easy, easy for them to learn as yeah. well. It was actually a book about kids oh, awesome. beading. Yeah. They actually made a, a lanyard and a pen holder for their uh, their grandma in this book. And That's so, great. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, excellent beginner technique. So I think we can move on to our next items here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of be great. We'll switch this out here. In front of me, we've got a set of earrings and a gorgeous necklace hat and a dress and it looks like there's a connection between them all there is definitely is this is actually a set of uh regalia that i made for the couch and valley arts festival mm -hmm. um that just um finished the other day so i was very excited to be able to bring this with me because we just went and picked it up yesterday amazing <laughs> from the art show um and i was very happy to have received the jurors award actually for the art show for That's this incredible. for this piece yeah and I'll, there are some photos of the full regalia online yeah. Yeah. on a on a mannequin that i'd set up in the yard and taken some really nice photos of but i would love to talk a little bit about the yeah. whole collection Please. um 
the hat. Can we start with the hat? Because the, the fact that this is a regular looking yeah. felt hat, yes. but then the rim is alive and vibrant with beadwork. Mm. And tell me about this process here, because it seems so, to be something that's very fascinating. So it's a very um, 20s style yeah. um, cloche wool felted hat. Yeah. And I had been seeing these absolutely gorgeous Stetsons and 10 gallon hats mm. and um, cowboy hats and outback hats. And people have been doing the the most beautiful beadwork on the edges of these things. Mm -hmm. And I've been keeping this hat for a while because I thought that I was actually going to um, bead the hat itself. Yeah. But I think with the style, it wanted something a little bit flashy, but still understated. Yeah, you know? subtle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't immediately come across as um, as being something that's particularly Southwest. Yeah. Um, that's a little ambiguous, you know. So it could be, you know, from a for a number of different different influences. So this whole group um, and the whole mannequin that I presented for the art show, I called um, my people are the blueberry people, and just just to open the conversation about how important blueberries are mm -hmm. to Métis culture mm -hmm. and, and all First Nations, all Indigenous cultures in, mm -hmm. in, in, in North America. But in particular, I have such a strong connection to the blueberry because it is, um, it's such a hub for mm -hmm. us, you know. Um, and I talk about it a little bit online, but, you know, even just through harvesting the blueberry and preparing it and going out onto the land and gathering it, it reinforces community bonds, it reinforces family bonds, it reinforces family teachings and, you know, through through its preparation and through its you know, making it into food and all of these things and drying it and making pemmican and, and making blueberry jam and all of this stuff, again, it's a reinforcing land-based practices mm -hmm. and so like at every stage of our relationship with the blueberry, even in our relationship with the seasons and waiting for them to ripen and all of this yeah. stuff, you know? It, it all comes back to being people of the land who are, who are, who are bound by those seasons. Yeah. And, and it's something seemingly super innocuous. Like you just think about this, like, oh, it's just a berry on a bush. But yeah. like at every point of our interaction with the blueberry, it, it reinforces our culture. Mm. And so this is what I wanted to represent with wow. this, with this outfit. And to have it be really timeless, that's why I picked the cloche yeah. hat. And the skirt that I made yeah. is based on a design put together. It's a high plane skirt okay. design um, that was put together by uh, Leah Dorian and Bonnie Johnson in okay. their ribbon skirt book, yeah. Yeah. which is a slightly different design than the one that I teach. Yeah. Um, but this is so reflective of the high plane skirts mm. that um, our, like my Métis ancestors would have you know, worn in yeah. the in the eighteen hundreds, being on the so plains, cool. being in the Red River, yeah. and um, and a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more representative of the actual style yeah. that they would have worn. Um, and so we've updated it and made it, you know, a true ribbon skirt. Mm -hmm. But I, I love that tiered style with this ruffle and everything like that. And did you design the fabric as well? This as well, yeah. So this is uh, my blueberry medicine fabric yep. that I designed and sell through Indigenous Nouveau on yep. my website, um, and it's available in a number of different. Uh, styles. I do this blueberry pattern on top of um, a birch bark print as well. Wow. So there's a blueberry birch bark uh, design as well as this straight blueberry medicine. You know, was the ribbons an aesthetic look or was it for a practical purpose? Do you know historically? Uh, well, there's there's a couple of yeah. different... Um, mm. There are a couple of different ways that we can talk about the ribbons mm. themselves. I mean, the ribbons are something that was, and it's something that I go very in depth with, with the project and, and the inf information on the ribbon skirt uh, project website, yes. um, that these accents mm -hmm. became a very real way to show um, Affluence, but for it to be very understated yeah, as well, right? right? So things like with the introduction of, of lace and yeah. and um, things, you know, very fancy things like mm. ribbons and crinoline and all of these things, um, where we're looking at the traditional skirts of the plains yeah. and tea dresses and all and buckskin dresses and buckskin skirts and ceremonial dresses, um, we see their evolution um, to a very different, a very different piece of clothing mm -hmm. with the original meanings of these 
ceremonial dresses, yeah. but with modern, um, with modern materials. And so um, there's something, you know, very flashy mm -hmm. and very, um, very colorful about a skirt like this, which to me doesn't always really represent um, the historical record that we have of, especially of women, Métis women in their dresses. Mm -hmm. You usually have this very um, subdued black mm -hmm. or gray or, um, or silver colored mm -hmm. dresses in a Basque style. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very, very starched, very mm -hmm. stiff. But they still do have ribbons, you know. Yeah. They're, but they're, there's a subtlety to them mm -hmm. where, um, you know, we have... I mean, there's so, there's, there's so many different eras that yeah. skirts existed in. We're talking about an evolution over, yeah. like, you know, 400 years of, of skirts, yeah. right? So, um, but one of the periods that I do really talk about um, is, is, is the first introduction of ribbons mm -hmm. and, like, the, um, the distribution of them yeah. from forts out into First Nations communities with yeah. them with the women that were, the indigenous women that were living in the forts and then taking those materials out into their communities mm. and that adaptation from traditional skills, yeah. traditional um, quill work designs and the geometric quill work designs and the, how that evolved into the ribbon folding techniques that we see in like the Fox and the Menominee mm. and, and um, um, in Anishinaabe ribbon work yeah. um, and how those very complex designs ended up um, simplifying themselves um, in some designs and in some areas and then becoming even more complex in other areas. So it's it's a very huge topic yeah, yeah, um, of course, yeah. because, you know, at, at different points in Canada and at different times, yeah. we have different levels of contact, yes, right? Yeah. You know, and different uses of, of materials, you know, you'd end up with huge amounts of, of ribbons available, yeah. huge amounts of lace and, and calico and silk and things available on the East Coast where, you know, as they trickled down to these smaller communities yeah. along rivers and stuff like that, along the trade routes, you know, you might only have a very small amount of ribbon that was qu really quite expensive. Yeah. And so, you know, you'd have to be very economical with it, you know, like yeah. doing the trims on your wrists yeah. or your tops of your mukluks and your moccasins. Yeah. So we don't always see necessarily the ribbons on the skirts. We see the ribbons as trim on uh, hoods and yeah. and and cuffs and and boots and things like that as well so Amazing. you know it the evolution of the ribbon skirt it, it it is very incredibly varied and and complex history but um but i think that most of the ribbon skirts that are being made today are are, are really an homage to you know they're really all encapsulating of this introduction of european materials um and that clash that um that cross-pollination of styles which is again a celebration of the main tea. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The, 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 the two it's worlds. kind of the epitome of, yeah. <laughs> of where we find a lot of uh, a lot of our, our roots for sure. Amazing. So, yeah, with the with the blueberry pieces here too, um, there are a pair of earrings, and mm. they have three tiers to them. Yep. There are three pieces on each one, and they are all hinged with sterling silver yep. um, wires. They have sterling silver plated beads around the outsides of them. And the ear wires themselves are sterling silver, and they've got little faceted lapis lazuli stones in them uh, to mimic the shape of the blueberries. Oh, yeah, they're nice and smoky still, too. Mm. So if you wear these, you can smell. You can, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. This is great. So you'd so, get the aromatics of yeah. all of that going It's like your... part fashion, part um, aromatherapy. Absolutely, yeah. It's amazing, amazing. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Indigenous aromatherapy, yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd have, like, a whole line of, like... Pemmican yeah. and like bear grease and smoked hide and yeah, all along like fresh like lake water, yeah. like toasting, like toasted uh, wild rice. Yeah. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Hey, yeah. just have like a whole candle series. That is awesome. <laughs> that'd be amazing. Cabin sense. Um, so this is the necklace that actually matches the earrings and it is a full collar. Um, so it sits like quite prominently yeah. when you when you wear it. It takes yeah. up quite a bit of the... Yeah. The chest of the person. Um, and on the back, I noticed there's a little pocket. Yeah, so on the back of all of my medallions, I yeah. actually put a pocket in the back of them so that you can put medicine in them. Yeah, Incredible. So you can wear a little piece of cedar or sage or lavender yeah. or whatever your whatever your medicine is, and you just wow. keep it close to your skin, close to your heart, so there's just enough room there to slip a few, few little sprigs of whatever your medicine is in there or tobacco and wear it. Um, Incredible. You know, like beadwork and, and art and everything like that is medicine, but... Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody has their medicinal plants as well. So. Amazing. Thank you. It's so yeah, beautiful absolutely. how it comes together. Yeah. I'm glad that you're enjoying this. And so um, I suppose we can talk about... Do your next. 
the next yeah, uh, skirt. Know. Yeah, be careful, we can then. So um, here we have two different examples of ribbon skirts, and I just wanted to talk really briefly about this because I touched on the subject mm -hmm. of the blueberry skirt that I had done, and it's in a very distinct style that represents a lot more of the clothing that was um, that was of the style mm -hmm. at the time where we see indigenous or where we see Métis women wearing ribbon skirts. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this is a design that was put together um, from historical. Uh, clothing, historical costuming by um, Bonnie Johnson mm -hmm. and um, Leah Dorian. And so I chose this skirt to represent the timelessness of, mm. of the collection yeah. for the My People or Blueberry People. But I wanted to talk a little bit about another design that I do. Yeah. Because the ribbon skirt project um, that I'm working on right now is a project to provide ribbon skirt kits to... Um, members of the Métis community in British Columbia mm -hmm. who are isolated due to COVID mm -hmm. or disability or financial difficulties. And so through the help of MNBC and one of their arts grants, mm -hmm. I was able to put together this, um, what is now a small foundation yeah. um, to provide ribbon skirt kits wow. and teachings to people throughout the province. It's amazing. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's been a quite, quite an arduous task, yeah. but um, I'm starting to get really on top of it. And most of the kits have been shipped out now. Yeah. So um, finish the PDF. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this style of skirt too. So this is another one of my patterns. It's the bleeding heart pattern. Um, and I, this is another one that's available on my website, but it is a little bit different because it's not as traditional of, mm. um, of a motif that we generally see in beadwork, especially with my, uh, fabric patterns, I really wanted to demonstrate my personal experience of being a Métis in British mm -hmm. Columbia. Yeah. And for me, the wild bleeding heart is something that's so identifiable as British Columbian as a wildflower. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of like, you know, dogwoods and things like that and yeah. like really identifiably British Columbian plants yeah. because I'm seeing them through a Métis lens yeah. living in British Columbia, right? It's so, you know, um, I wanted to to represent where I live, yeah. not just where I'm from. Yeah, you know, uh, but again, this is bridging worlds again. Yeah. Totally, that's yeah. exactly what it is. So this is a very simple skirt. So it's a very straight skirt. It's yeah. one panel yeah. all the way down, and then it's uh, cinched a little bit at the waist. It's a little bit narrow at the waist. Yeah. But I, this is the design that I've chosen to use for the ribbon skirt kits themselves because we're dealing with people. Um, I'm te I'm teaching people who have never sewn before. Yeah, and so I wanted to do something that was really. Um, a simple way to teach them really basic sewing techniques, so awesome. simple stitches, yeah. um, simple designs, simple ways of measuring your body properly, yeah. and then executing a project that looks like it's very professionally yeah. made, but I could still teach people like the basic sewing techniques who had never sewn before, and then their first sewing project actually being something practical and large that they can wear, and awesome. have it being like a ceremonial piece for them to help reconnect them with their communities. So that was really, you know, uh, I talked about it in the first podcast as well, but you know, how the ribbon skirt project ended up turning into something so much larger than yeah. I had anticipated. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the focus of, of the skirt project is the very simple skirt, but I just wanted to illustrate some of the differences between the two. It's amazing. And um, the final thing that I have to show, uh, I have a few poppies here. I, uh, <clears throat> One of the projects that I've worked on for the last bunch of years is the Poppy Project, and I've been doing it a little bit subtly, um, but this year I think I'm going to put a little bit more energy into publicizing it a little bit more. So um, I've always donated 25% um, of all my sales um, from all of my poppies to a different veterans or mm. indigenous veterans organization mm -hmm. every year, but I uh, sell beadwork poppy kits on mm -hmm. my website. So this is one of the products that I have on my website where I have a full PDF instructional uh, to show people the basic techniques on how to bead their very own poppies and illustrate the need for a little bit more education concerning Indigenous veterans mm -hmm. and the difference between um, uh, Remembrance Day and Indigenous Veterans Day, which is yes. actually November 8th. Yes and to highlight a little bit more of the story of the disenfranchisement of the Métis in particular um, after the Second World War and the loss of a lot of our land and to understand a little bit more of the struggle of, of you know, 
again, disenfranchisement and, and systemic racism that led to a lot of um, imposter syndrome and identity issues in the Métis community. Yeah. And I think that um, this is a really big opportunity to understand um, the culture uh, that came out of road allowances, that came out of that disenfranchised culture. So when we talk about one aspect of Métis culture, we, you know, we talk about a lot of different ones, yeah. right? And so um, <clears throat> I do have this PDF available on the website as well as the poppy kits themselves. But part of the conversation is, um, you know, providing links and everything like that so that people can do their own investigations yeah. in it. And then in the fall, I do a couple of tutorial classes where people can just sign up and then watch me beat and we just talk about um, the issues surrounding it and and ways that they can get involved in Indigenous uh, veterans organizations and um, for themselves too. I encourage people to take the designs and make as many as they absolutely want. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a license, like it's fully licensed so anybody can take the designs, make them and sell them and then make their own donations to the to uh, veterans wow. associations as and well. If I want to buy one from yeah. you, I can do that on your site as well. Uh, yeah, I will have them available a little bit closer in the fall. I usually try to make a bunch of them and then yeah. release them right before Remembrance Day to yeah. highlight. Limited run. Yeah, to really highlight that season and to put a lot of emphasis on, on the meaning behind the project. So. Amazing. So if you want to go to this website or yeah. even watch the video version yeah. of this uh, <laughs> you know, recording uh, or vice versa, if you want, or you're watching the video version mm -hmm. and want to listen to the audio version, uh, all the links are going to be in the show notes, um, those that are listening right now. Links Absolutely. to both the website where you can check out the kit, <clears throat> links to where you can watch the video, the full visual version of this interview. Mm -hmm. Um, these are amazing. Thank these are you. beautiful. And I love that you use the um, oh, yeah, I call. Care, or, um, elk hair tufting as well. In yeah, those ones, yeah. yeah, elk hair tufting. It's incredible with beadwork, mm -hmm. with hide work as well. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Amazing. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Darian. I really appreciate it. This has been an exploration in incredible Métis uh, artwork, craft work, uh, with gives. And, and I feel like what is, is so neat about this is both historical education and it's beautiful and it's wearable. And you can, you know, it's got some bling on it as well, which I think is so great. Everybody loves a little bit of bling. But Everyone, yeah, you yeah. have to, you have to engage people. You have to, you have to make it interesting for people to engage in their own culture and, and make, connection yeah. to their heritage, Absolutely. which I think is yep. so neat. And and maybe it is. Maybe people. I, I think what's so neat about this show is people who are wanting to kind of get connected to their Métisness and, mm. and discovering what that means. Maybe it's a small step they can take to connecting to their heritage by maybe wearing something, mm -hmm. or or making something that connects them to their history. Yeah, we talked a lot about that in the in the first yeah, uh, yeah. the first edition of this or the first section of this about, you know, land-based practices yeah. and skills um, skills sharing and, and and knowledge sharing really contributing to not knowledge accumulation but self-exploration and self-investigation because of how diverse and how vast the Métis community is across mm -hmm. Canada and from so many different Indigenous influences and so many different European influences, we're all really quite disparate in, in, our, in our traditions and our heritage. So it's important for you to make your own investigations to what's appropriate for you and your own family teachings and your own lineage and your own community. Amazing. Thank you again for being here. Thanks, Darian. This has been the Métis Speaker Series podcast. I'm Darian Kovacs. Thanks to Métis Nation BC for making this possible with funding provided by the Civil Forfeiture Office's Indigenous Healing Stream. You can listen to all of our episodes, learn more about the podcast, and sign up to the Métis Nation of BC newsletter to stay up to date on Métis news at metispodcastseries.ca. You can find out more about the music we're playing by Love Life by visiting SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash lovelifeofficial, L-U-V-L-Y-F official, and link in the show notes for your convenience. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast listening device. See you again soon. Mina Kawapa Mitten. Thank you, Marcy, for listening. <laughs>